Next, I'd like to call up for our next pres presenter, Rose Heavyhead, Two-Spirit Presentation. Okay, eight time is to go. I'm uh, glad to be here to, uh, you know, share what I have done uh, with uh, um, Two-Spirit, uh, you know, helping, trying to help our community uh, that are uh, like myself, uh, two spirit person, but I want to um, light the smudge first before I start. Um, my Indian name is Ayaki Tukumi. That was my grandmother's name, Clara Crowchief, and uh, that means uh, dividing thunder. So uh, that's who I am. I'm from Ghana. If anyone doesn't know where I'm from, but that's where I'm from, Ghana. And uh, I was raised on the reserve here, and I work on the reserve also right now. So in um, 2006, um, I was in the same room right here. We did, uh, Apukatsun did a two-spirit youth conference. It was the first one they've done in Alberta. And it was a two-day conference, and um, I was helping them with that conference. And... So I was one of the keynote speakers, and that was my first time to ever talk, you know, uh, in publicly about, you know, me as a two-spirit person. And uh, so within all that time, um, you know, I've been doing different things, but it, it's very hard, I find, on the reserve to get things going. Um, you know, what I wanted was a support group where people can come you know, once a, uh, every two weeks, you know. First I had it secluded because some people, I, you know, for their uh, safety or, you know, they didn't want people to know they were, you know, two-spirit. So they, um, I would have it in Cardston at that grotto, you know, kind of someplace secluded out of the way. And, um, but people weren't really coming. And then, so I had it in standoff at the Great Hall a few times. And then eventually I just went right to the multi-purpose and I had it right there in the, uh, one of those elder room there. And still, uh, you know, and I had a Facebook group, you know, I'd invite people, but I had it closed because there was some uh, males that were in there. They didn't want people to know that uh, they were two-spirit because they were part of the, um, our, our cultural societies here on the reserve and, and they're scared they were going to get shunned by the other, you know, um, men especially that are in the ceremony. They were scared, you know, and um, so I had to keep that group closed. Only uh, members that uh, I knew for sure were two-spirit, I would add them in. And uh, so in there, I would put the dates and times and place where we were going to have our gatherings. And still it was, you know, uh, hard getting people to come. I wanted them to come so that they could be part of our planning of what we're going to do. Because I didn't want to just put, put things on people, what they wanted to do. I wanted them to be part of this. Hey? And then finally after um, I myself started going out to um, Montana, Two-Spirit Gathering in Browning, there's uh, Steve Borios. He's been doing this uh, two-spirit gathering there for probably over 20 years now. And he told me, too, the same thing. It's very slow going, getting our people together, hey? Especially on the reserves. In the cities, it's a lot easier to get people together because um, I guess it's not very close within the community where people are shunned, hey? And... Uh, so, and then, yeah, after that, you know, because of COVID, I couldn't go to Montana, but I, I was there, you know, for quite a few years. I went every year, and they even um, had me there as a two-spirit elder, too, because I spoke the language, and I had my pipe, too. I did my piercing sun dance at Morris Crows back in uh, the early 19, 1990s. So my pipe is about, um, you know, over 30 years old, or, and so uh, I use my pipe to help me, you know, with what I'm doing. It, I, you know, living this, uh, um, <clears throat> being born this way is, uh, it was hard for me on the reserve. I was really, uh, you know, bullied and stuff like that. And so I did turn to alcohol and that. And, and it got to the point where, um, you know, I would start going on these long days of drinking then we'd run out of money, and so we'd end up start to drink, um, you know, bad things, hey, like um, Listerine, Branvin, stuff like that, hey, just to, um, well, you know, to 
not to feel sick and stuff like that. But it got me to that point where, um, you know, like this is, um, in a, it's hard for people that live this way in a community where you're not accepted, hey? And so we turn to these ways to cope, hey? And that's what I did. And uh, But it was through our Native culture that helped me to turn away from that. And I did my life skills program with uh, Phil Lane uh, through the University of Lethbridge. It was a nine-month life skills program. And that really helped me because I started learning about cultural awareness. And, uh, you know, because I was raised um, and I went to the residential school up to grade six. And so I was really brainwashed with the... With the um, you know, saying that I was going to, um, you know, with the Bible there, it says you're going to burn in hell for your sin. And so I thought even though if I try to be good or whatever, you know, what's the use? I'm still going to burn in hell because in there it says that you're, if you're if you're too spirit or gay, that, you you know, that's not right. Hey? So I was, um, you know, when I found out more about the native culture and, uh, you know, there's no such thing as the hell, you know, the hell, the devil. So I felt you know, better about myself. And um, I was able to um, complete that nine month program. I graduated from it. And right away I was able to go to the college. Um, I took child and youth care there in uh, 94. And I started working after when I graduated from that in Calgary at Woods Homes. I worked there for about five years. And when the youth ranch opened, I applied and I got a job, so I was down there. But I was glad I was able to come back to my community. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of our people here, you know, uh, to help. And uh, in at the youth ranch, I started a, a group there. With, we knew there was kids coming there that were two-spirit. And so I started a group there with them. On Fridays, we'd go to that ceremonial room. I'll get food and... We just talk, and I have to really talk myself first. Then finally, they start talking to you. And after they really look forward to Fridays, and they wanted the food too. They want start picking what kind of food to buy. So, but it was good, and um, and so, anyways, I I did this kind of thing to to help my uh, you know our community here. This here um, picture painting here I did, and. I like to share a lot of the culture that I've learned growing up too, because as a two-spirit person, um, you know, it's not just about who you are um, if you're in a relationship. It's about the whole person, hey? And so in history, in our culture, um, what I've learned from the elders that I taught to, uh, they said that we weren't, two-spirit people weren't higher then uh, within the Blackfoot, we weren't higher than other people or we weren't lower. We were equal with everybody else. Some other cultures, um, they, um, you know, them, they're higher up where they would bring their babies to these two-spirit people to give names to them. And they would have really good lives, these babies, when they grew up. They're saying that Geronimo was one of those babies that was taken to a two-spirit with the nav. Uh, Navajo, I think that's what he was, or was he a Hopi, Geronimo, and um, so that's just uh, one of the examples, and also, um, you know, when there was orphan children, too, they would bring them to the two-spirit people to raise them, and they didn't, uh, you know, they knew they would be raised, right, so that was part of the, the Navajo people, too. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this here, is the sun that's at uh, Cypress Hills. Um, circumference is about a mile. And long ago, before we were put on reserves, um, all the different tribes um, came to the sun dance. And so uh, we had similar um, spiritualities, sp uh, similar uh, relationships, same relationships to each other, even... Um, Throughout these years working, you know, in Calgary and um, on the reserve with our uh, the people from the north, I learned that uh, some of our languages are the same. Like when we say "astu," the Crees they say "astam," and when we say "ma," they say "na." And um, 
so there's other words too, and there's one that's um, it's kind of funny, but I won't share it right now. And uh, anyways, but they uh, they so it just shows that we had close relationships with each other. There wasn't always like what the white people say, warfare and all that kind of stuff. And they call our headdresses war bonnets. Like it's just a way to pull us apart and you know to to fight amongst each other, hey. And so when we were put on the reserves, then they weren't going to give them a pass just to go to someone else's sun dance hey, or ceremony. So this here ended. But with all the other um, tribes, they have names for uh, two-spirit elders. I mean, sorry, two-spirit people. And with us, I was taking kind of studies on the reserve here. And uh, Bruce Wolfchild came to our class, and he was teaching... Uh, the kind of um, traditional family traditional roles, and then he said in there, um, he said uh, the other thing is um, these people that are um, gay. He said it's not nice to call them what we call them right now, awaki skatsi or aneskatsi. That those are like put down words, eh? And I remember growing up hearing those words, and yeah, they are uh, put down. And uh, he said the real way. Real Blackfoot way we call them is awawaki. Uh, a two spirit is called uh, awawaki. And but I never did tell him uh, exactly what does that word mean. But um, I know our language; it's descriptive. So how something behaves, or how it looks, or something that's how they will name uh, name the uh, that whatever it is that they're naming. And so to me, I was thinking about it and. I was thinking, awawaki, it sounds to me like awawu, when somebody is walking, pacing back and forth, eh? And so to me, um, I think that could mean um, like when uh, the subtle changes in characteristics of a person that's uh, two-spirit, they kind of show some feminism in them, and they're masculine, and it kind of goes back and forth like that, eh? So awawaki, so that's an aki is woman. So I, I was just thinking maybe that's why they were given that name. I was just curious because some people, um, you know, they ask questions. Why was it that name? You know, so I just thought of maybe that's what it can be. But if any elders here, you know, know exactly what that, that name could mean, because I went to Atan too uh, after that when, um, when I heard that name. And I, uh, Atan said, yes, that is that word. That is true. That's. The word we say for a two-spirit person is awaki. The other one I went to was um, my friend uh, Jordan Heavy Shields, and uh, he said too that yes, that's that word that we use. And so, and then through going to Montana and that um, knowing the people there, their elders too, and there was a man there. He said there was one guy that comes from Brock to to them too, and they said that um, the name for a woman is called man-hearted woman. Ninas kitsipahpaki. And so um, I talked to Beverly Little Bear about that, and she was saying, yeah, that she's heard that word too. And so um, just within this time, I was glad that we had, you know, I was able to get these names because growing up, you know, my parents and people just never said those words, hey? And that's how, you know, because of, being in the Catholic Church, you know, and that, then they brainwashed us. And so they don't talk about uh, those kind of things, you know. And uh, But, you know, now we need to start going back to um, how we were before um, the white people brought their, their uh, you know, religion to us. And so the other tribes throughout North America, they all have their words to you for uh, two-spirit people. And oh yeah, my notes. I kind of put some notes here. Usually, this um, this presentation, I I can do it like in two days or a day. But uh, you know, this time it's really a short time. So I'm just trying to uh, put in things that I want to make sure that I talk about. So I kind of put some notes here. Um, so I could remember. But. 
So with the church coming, um, so with the white people before um, the 13th century, it was okay for them to be, uh, I guess, gay. They, it was accepted in their culture. But it was after the 13th century, it's always like about politics, who has the power and stuff like that between the uh, kings, I guess, of the land and uh, the church. And so they said that it was wrong, the church, and they uh, started making it law that for them not that they couldn't do that any longer. And uh, so when they came this way, then that's when they put it onto our people too that that was wrong. Also, uh, you know, um, those are the anti, uh, anti-gay um, people that are against uh, this type of things. They, they're in like, it's kind of lo- like more political type stuff. Also, um, in 19, uh, 2009, in, uh, President Obama, he was the one that made um, that law, um, the Hate Crime Prevention Act, was signed by law because of two really uh, horrific um, incidents that happened in the United States, uh, the Matthew Shepard and James Breyer Jr., uh, where they were killed there because of being too spirit. And so, you know, we have protection and uh, things are changing with that. And and myself, you know, it's kind of sad, like even in our own community, I experienced that and I sort of had to bring that up one time at my work because somebody um, was, um, you know, you know, they were doing their passive aggressive um, talking towards me, you know, around uh, the other staff. And so I had to um, talk to that person and he stood up and he was, he was telling me, well, you know, it's in the Bible. That's not right, you know. So I had to uh, talk to him more and about that, and I had to bring this law up, I mean, you know, because uh, I didn't know if my work would back me up to, you know, because this guy was talking to me like that. But he uh, changed after that, that guy, and, you know, but he didn't no longer work there anymore. I guess he found a different job. But it's sad that, you know, this does happen in our community, and even at our... uh, uh, there was a round dance going on at this one place, and uh, I was there, and um, this announcer was saying, okay, this next song is for all the Two-Spirit societies and the Two-Spirit people. Come up and dance. And everybody was just sitting there. Nobody got up, you know, because this person was mocking, you know, people. And and I was sitting there, and it heard at me, and I looked around, and I knew, and I seen people that I knew were Two-Spirit too. And uh, they... Um, you know, so I just had to leave. I just waited outside. And I, I thought I would talk to that person. I couldn't get him for a long time. Finally got him alone to talk to him. And uh, I told him, it's hard, you know. I'm trying to make changes for our people on the reserve regarding this. And, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, high standing in our community. You know, it's hard for people if you talk like that, you know, to try to make changes. Because you don't know who you're hurting in that room. You could have, you know, parents that have children or a grandchild that is two-spirit or a sibling, you know, or even a parent, you know. And uh, it's hard for them to be who they are when people talk like that. So this person apologized, but they couldn't look me in the eye when they apologized, but they did apologize. So these are just, you know, real facts that... I want to share, you know, with what I've go, I go through, but most likely other people go through that are two-spirit in our community. It's sad that I've known um, some friends that have passed away because they were two-spirit. They're living the risky lifestyle. They end up, you know, like coming back from Vancouver, you know, in a, you know, um, they get... Uh, you know, something from those drugs that they take and they get sick, they pass on. A lot of them uh, from alcoholism passing away because they couldn't be who they really are inside. They were scared to let people know, their families especially. Uh, A lot of shame. 
And um, so there's this one thing that I like, um, you know, regarding um, people um, that are, I guess, still kind of really brainwashed in a way. But it's, it says, if you're indigenous and you're homophobic, you have been successfully colonized. So that something to think about is if we, if we were elders, if we really talk and say that we love each other, you know, in our community, well, we have to be kinder to people that we know that are two-spirit. And, uh, you know, not to make fun out of them, you know, and because I hear that myself, you know, they joke amongst each other and stuff like that, and it's hurtful, hey? So, <clears throat> let me just see. Oh, yeah, okay, so... I wanted to add this one here, back to that. Um, when I was working at the Kaina Healing Lodge, um, I did s these presentations, one, you know, when we get clients in every six weeks. And so I, I do this uh, presentation. And this one man, he got mad in there, and he says, um, why do I have to learn this part of my treatment? I don't think I, I, I don't want to learn about this in here. Why do I have to learn it? And then he got up and he left the room. And so anyways, um, with that, uh, you know, people don't realize sometimes, um, you know, if they were sexually abused as a child and if they were sexually abused by, if they're a male and they were sexually abused by a male, they don't realize, they don't realize, they think that that person was gay. And so they take it out on all gay people you know, they don't like gay people. If they had a chance, they beat them up or call them down because they were sexually abused by them. But um, there's been studies on this, and there's a big difference between a person that's gay and a pedophile. And so a pedophile, he's going to, or she, there's very, uh, just a few women that are that way, but mostly ma male. Uh, they will pick uh, male and female, um, you know, children. They don't care like to do that stuff to adults, so they choose to do that to children. And um, so that's something to realize. And you know, people that we don't know, um, they can be struggling with that because all these years working with, um, you know, counseling as a counselor, I find that's a really big issue: sexual abuse, and it really affects a person, you know, the rest of their life, eh? And so um, if they need to make that change, they really have to do that healing, counseling, and get down to why am I angry at, you know, about this and that, hey? And so with this presentation, I'm trying to make corrections and help people that are either two-spirit or, you know, they think, uh, you know, their misconception about, you know, uh, you know, if they were sexually abused and if they think, you know, it was a gay person, it's a pedophile actually, not a gay person. And uh, the studies, like I've been reading on the studies too and stuff, they say that uh, one in 20 people would be, will be gay. And so um, that's very low, you know, regarding if, you know, it's, it's sad, there's a high percentage of people that were sexually abused and so you know, um, so it's from uh, straight people, not just gay people or the ones that are sexually abusing. Hey? So I really needed to, uh, wanted to clarify that. And it's also what I read on um, about the churches in the 13th century when they started making those changes about, uh, you know, that they could do that. Because some of them, they were doing that to children too. And so I think that was part of it why they had to, they were making that law and change. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's a sensitive topic, and I, I know it was hard for me. You know, usually when I do this, I talk with younger people or people, you know, uh, non-native people, but here it's kind of a little bit different here because I respect our elders, and I know with my mom and um, some of our elders, they say, you don't talk about those kind of stuff, you know, you know, but it has to be... Um, talked about, hey, you know, because some people we don't know, maybe that's why they use their alcohol and drugs, hey, you know, it's a topic that has to be um, spoken 
about and it's okay and to take away the shame. So uh, core values. Um, so this is uh, the core values that our elders tell us to live by. And uh, compassion, gimapipitsin, respect, wisdom, mokaksin, being kind and peaceful, harmony, uh, <clears throat> generosity, truthfulness, courage, achievement, a sense of the sacred. That means like smudging, protecting, you know, uh, respecting your body and that. Uh, thankfulness, humility, uh, a real person, and a fine person is a matsua pitapi. And that's when we get older, we hope to um, get to that point and that we follow these core values in our life and that we take care of our body, dress our body nice and respect our body. Our creator lives within us, with us, our spirit in us. And so we, um, we need to respect our body and take care of it. And so these are some of the core values that our elders tell us to live by. Um, when I was taking Kainai studies, I learned a lot of this in there with the Kainai peace keep, peacemaking and peacekeeping with, um, what's her name, uh, Marietta, oh no, not Marietta, uh, Annabelle Crawford Wolf. So I just like to... Uh, mention where I get my information from because I know it's really important in our cultural ways when you share something you always refer back to your elder who you got this information from it just kind of validates what you're saying because our stuff is not written in books yeah so uh, kinship um, our families were close-knit uh, when the white people came they kind of separated us but um, like um, we have grandparents um, mothers fathers brothers sisters children um, so our our nieces and nephews those are our grandchildren also our cousins are our brothers and sisters so that is makes us close I remember Atan used to always tell my daughter Chelsea these are your brothers, these are your sisters, you know. And so my daughter Chelsea grew up like that, calling her cousins her brothers and sisters. So, And uh, <clears throat> this picture right here, uh, this one right here, I got this picture in Browning, Montana, when I was gathering information on the Two Spirit, and uh, someone was telling me something about a pipe, that there may be a pipe or something in Browning, regarding two spirits. So I just went there and, I, and then uh, I went to the to the museum there and the guy um, let me take this picture there because they don't allow pictures in that museum. But he said that this boy right here, um, he thinks uh, he was uh, two spirit. The artist, uh, his last name was Pepian and he did this painting, original painting in uh, 1944. And so how they, his stories and what he learned and how, when he painted this painting, he just did it the way, you know, uh, it, he was told things. And so they're saying that this boy here was probably Two-Spirit because um, he's wearing a breech cloth, but he should be over here with the boys, you know, playing hunting and all that, riding horses. But instead, he's doing a girl's job, a woman's job. Uh, he's bringing water to the uh, cooking area. But they don't, um, you know, discourage them. They let them uh, dress the way they want and, you know, live their, their life the way they want. So that's what the, the guy shared with me at the museum and he let me take this painting, a uh, picture of this painting. And I uh, just like to, uh, you know, like, um, I guess Narcissus used these, uh, also these authors and the Aboriginal studies at the university, and we did that too with the uh, Kainai studies. Um, James Willard Schultz, he lived amongst the Blackfeet for about 50 years, 
And so these books that he has, they're very informative. And a lot of them, like when I was going to school, elementary, I remember Rosie, uh, day rider, used to come and tell us stories. And, uh, and then next thing I hear these stories in these, these books. Um, I remember that one where that one guy went hunting at Chief Mountain and there was a hole there and there was smoke coming up and he threw a rock in there and that fire came up, hey? Eh? And uh, that's when the story when we got our first thunder pipe. But uh, I just remember that small little part about when Rosie told me the story. <laughs> and so um, in that book, then uh, one of those books there, I, I, I see the whole story in there. Uh, the other one is Walter McClintock. He also lived really long with the native people. And this elder here is, uh, brings down the sun. For, he was a chief in 1896 um, in, from the North Pagans. And so they went there to visit him. Eventually, uh, eventually he started sharing his stories with this Walter. At first, he didn't trust him. And so we are lucky that these people did write those stories down. They lived with our people. So not all white people are bad, whatever, you know. And, you know, so we learned from, you know, they shared those stories. They wrote them down so today we can, you know, read them. But you have to be careful which books you read. Some books aren't accurate, hey? So I just wanted to share these ones with you. And uh, the other one is uh, this one. His name was Robert N. Wilson. They called him Long Crow Face. And he wrote uh, in Narcissus, uh, his program there, he called it Our Betrayed Wards. It was uh, one class there that this guy here, he was an Indian agent first on the reserve. Then later he owned that store. That's kind of where uh, Taco Joe's is up on that hill there. He became a merchant. But he had written all the um, information on... Uh, you know how we were very successful when we first started living on the reserve, you know, and we lived at this end first where the, um, the uh, forts where we did our trade with uh, Fort Wupa, Fort Kip. But later, eventually, we accepted being here and we had to be farmers and that ranchers. So a lot of people moved down that end of the reserve. And so this guy, he he wrote down the dates and what happened, like how we really got uh, gypped by the white people, white, uh, you know, the local farmers. There was a time where they were going to go sell our cattle. They were all on the train. And then in the middle of the prairie, they stopped the train and they let off all our cattle because their, their excuse was, oh, their feet are going to freeze, you know, so we had to let them off. But they didn't want us to be successful, so they let off all our cattle. So that's one of the, um, you know, things that they did. And the other thing was we were so, um, you know, uh, doing so well in our farming and that, that we were able to buy our farm equipment and all that, you know, right out. We had the money, and so we were, we are very successful. And one of those core values um, is achievement. And that's for, uh, you know, men in our communities. Um, it's sad, like, back then uh, when a boy is about 14 years old, he's considered a man back then. And so he has to go do a vision quest. He has to get a spiritual helper, and he has to, um, you know, he can't just go and pick a wife. He has to pay for his wife you know, through horses and that. He has to show that he's a good hunter and that to uh, be successful in the community. So it's important that we try hard, you know. And But the white people, of course, they don't want us to. Uh, I remember when I was young, my dad, you know, he worked uh, on our land there. He had a great big garden. And um, they, him and my mom worked their own land out that way, did their own field work and stuff. But I remember this one time, these um, thing there were the social services that came. They had like a briefcase and all that, and they wanted my dad to sign these papers. And my but my dad wouldn't sign them. And uh, my dad was saying that um, I guess some of his friends signed them. They signed up for social services, and they told him, "Well, you know, why do you have to work so hard? You don't even have to work. They'll just give you a check every month." And my my dad wouldn't sign it. Hey, 
So, um, you know, they plan these things way ahead of time, you know, what to, how to keep us down. And it's sad right now, you know, with the child welfare, they're doing that with our children still. You know, so we have to uh, find a way to, to stop them from doing that. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, these are some of the eminent scholars of Kainai Studies program. I know there's more than these that are here. Um, there's actually, I had two, uh, two of these, uh, you know, uh, slides with all the elders that helped make kind of studies. And uh, yeah, so uh, some of them are passed away. I'll just name some here. Uh, Margaret Heinemann, Adan, Leroy, Little Bear, Ellen, Prairie Chicken, Pete Standing Alone, Lewis Knife, uh, uh, Bernard Tallman, Rita Tallman, S Sophie Tail Feathers, Andrew Weasel Fat, Margaret Weasel Fat, Frank Weasel Head, Bruce Wolf Child. Uh, with Bruce, he came to um, meet us uh, about a month, uh, in the middle of September. Um, I have a sweat lodge um, out by my brother's place in Farm 4. And um, I have people, you know, my friends and that, that call me to come up to Calgary to do, um, you know, kind of similar to what I'm doing right now in a way, or just to open prayers and stuff. And I share a little bit of um, cul culture with them. And uh, I have relatives that live up there that work up there, like um, Sable Sweetgrass works with the arts and stuff like that. But uh, when they come down, sometimes then we have to sweat, and uh, we had this. Uh, we wanted to do a one-day fast, and and so we invited Bruce to come, and he came down there, and he talked to us for about three hours, and he's encouraging us. He's really glad that what we're doing. Um, he did come to um, the great hall that time when we had it there, and I have it on. Uh, if you guys ever look on my. Well, I guess I have to open it. <laughs> My Awawaki, uh, I call it Awawaki uh, group. It's uh, Facebook. Um, Bruce is on there. We, he let us videotape him, and he talked about some things there to us. He's encouraging us what we're doing, and he wants us to come to the Sundance, and so um, that's our, my goal is that we go to the Sundance with a TP, you know, Awawaki and... Uh, to be visible in the community in a positive way, to invite elders and other people to come and, uh, you know, just to come back to the community in a good way. And uh, to help people, you know, that are struggling with their alcoholism, drugs, uh, because I know culture and ceremony really help to, um, you know, it's very powerful to change that. It's helped myself, you know. This mountain back there, um, that's called Banik, uh, that's Mistak, that's in the west over that way. And it means uh, TP line or mountains. Just like what I said, uh, things that are descriptive, how they look and that, they'll name them. So this looks like TP liners, so that's why they called it that. I then uh, shared that with me a while ago, and then one of those books there with those authors, I think there was someone that went to. Um, go visit Bikani, and then that man, Walter, he said, McClintock, he says, and that, that's uh, TP Liner Mountains right there. <clears throat> um, yeah, so cultural acceptance of Awawaki. So I'm just really glad that uh, this name has really gone through our Blackfoot territory now again. I shared it back then with the uh, uh, Montana Two-Spirit Gathering. And right now, my friends, you know, when I talk to them on Facebook and that, they talk about that uh, Awawaki. And, uh, well, I learned that too from them too, that Nina uh, Skitsipahpaki, the name for a two-spirit woman. And then also, when I go to Calgary, the people there use this word a lot now too. So I'm glad that it's coming back because like I, you know, like what I done said, the Pisku, our language. So when we use our language in these ways, it strengthens that. So it'll strengthen the uh, people that Creator made this way. Huh? And then I just uh, like to share some 
some uh, of our societies there, that's Horn Society. There's uh, Shot on Both Sides, Larry Plum. And um, there was a man back then, he wanted to join these, like to be a leader. Um, and But be they told him, but because he doesn't have a wife, he was like a two-spirit man, um, he couldn't join with them because the wife is the one that, you know, smudges the the bundle and stuff like that. So he went to um, the home of, uh, I mean, sorry, <laughs> to the Malto geeks, and, and there they accepted him in there. And so he got to practice the, our spiritual way. Hey? And that's um, who we are. You know, spirituality is very important for us. And I, I have always wanted to invite uh, this man to our gatherings, uh, Joseph, um, Chief Body. But he is a very uh, private man, and um, he always, uh, you know, had excuse, I can't, you know, this and that day, but, you know, but uh, he he was one, and a lot of people knew, I remember when we were young, uh, we used to go to church and stand off, and, because I did talk to my dad about this, about me being two-spirit, and he told me, well, it's okay, he said uh, that... In church, when they used to go to church, there was a man there, and he would come with his little girl and his little uh, niece or something, and she would dress her up really nice, and he would be there with her. And people knew that he was two-spirit. He used to sit on this side. The men used to mostly sit on this side of the church and the women on this side, and he would sit with the women. And But nobody, you know, ever said anything about it, you know. They just accepted him how he was. And then here is the Moto Geeks. I'm just like showing these, uh, you know, these slides because I'm so proud of our our people, where we come from, you know. And this is what's helping us today to uh, to continue, um, you know, uh, being here because the white people really try to end our way of life. Eh? And then here's a ceremony. Um, this was probably from uh, one of uh, Adolf Hungry Wolf's books, these pictures here. And then this is, uh, I think, a beaver bundle ceremony that was going on. This lady uh, rides at the door. Then this was uh, Elkhorn. He was a brave dog society. And then just the work that they did uh, back then. And um, tanning hides. So this one here, uh, you know how when we pray and stuff like that and just stuff happens like, like coincidental, but it's not really coincidental. It's meant to be like that. And uh, so one time I was driving through that, uh, through St. Mary's, and then we took that road to Looking Glass Road. And then uh, we said, well, let's just go this way to um, that Two Medicine Lakes, and there's the uh, National Park. So we went there, and then next thing we, we seen cars all parking there. So we pulled in there, and there, next thing, um, there, they showed this here. Uh, it says, a uh, woman warrior, the story of running eagle. And on one big billboard, it was English. The other billboard, it was all in Blackfoot. And uh, that's uh, Pita Maka. And she was one of the last uh, woman warriors back in the 1700s before uh, the Napikons came in this area. And she was very successful as a warrior. And she also um, did the vision quest that the men usually do. She did a vision quest and she got her spirit helpers. And she was very successful in all her war raids for a long time. And she was honored with this warrior name, uh, Running Eagle. It was a name of a powerful warrior from way back. And they honored her with that name, Bita Mahka. And then eventually uh, she passed away, was killed on, uh, across the mountains that way in the Flathead tribe. And then her comrades brought her body back this way and she was buried up on a mountain overlooking these falls. 
and uh, there's two falls here. There's a, this is the snow when it melts, and there's actually another fall, right, like a cave, and that's where the, that it's all year round that that waterfall comes to there. And then uh, when the white people were surveying the land, uh, naming like uh, Duck Lake, uh, St. Mary's Lake, and they seen this waterfall, and then so they called it Trick Falls. They changed the name, and. You know, uh, the native people there in Montana, they're very well educated. They have to go to school or else the parents are going to be put in jail. So they all have to make sure their kids, you know, graduate. So they're very educated there. And um, so they went to court and they fought back for this name and they won it back. So the, the waterfall got its name back, Bita Mahka, and then they put these... Uh, billboards back there so um, I've gone there you know a lot of times throughout the years um, there's a I know in Browning they had a, a two-spirit uh, women there they had a wedding there and um, I brought my pipe there and I, I, I could tell it's very I uh, like their spirit there hey you know and uh, so it's a it's a powerful place there there was other uh, two-spirit people like uh, Bikanaki and there was other ones too that were back. Um, Hugh Dempsey wrote a book called Vengeful Wives and there's a whole chapter in there about two-spirit people, their names and their lives. So that, that's, I had that book and sometimes you lend them away. In, uh, but anyways, yeah, it's in that one. These are just some um, customs and beliefs, oral tradition, stories, sanctions, uh, rewards, giveaways, and ceremonies. So I just want to say with the Kindness Studies program, once I graduated from it, I really got uh, some um, employment with it. So, you know, it's good to, uh, you know, that's why I went to school to uh, learn a more about the culture. But I mean, I grew up with it, you know. Um, being around my grandfather, my parents, and uh, my neighbors down the hill, the little bears and uh, Mukaki and them used to always come over there to visit Edward and them. So I understand Blackfoot good, so I would hear their stories, and I always find them very interesting. And then with Kainai Studies, too, we went to all these sacred spots. This is... Um, <coughs> uh, uh, you know, you know, by Calgary and then uh, Napi in the rock. And then we even went to this one, Napi's playground that's up west there. And we even crossed that river. It was really co uh, cold. Some of those women were almost blowing, I mean, floating away. <laughs> those guys all had to hold their hands like that and so that they won't uh, float down. And so we walked and we went right to the spot where um, this... Uh, Lapis playground was and up on the hill, Narciss and them just went there, him and I think Joe Rickrow, uh, and these other women, they were up there and they were looking down at us come there. And so it's good to visit these places like, you know, um, they say the white people, we crossed this barren strait, but we have all these stories from the land. So it's really important to visit these places so they don't get lost and that our young people know where they are. And to do ceremony there, like bring your pipe, smoke your pipe there, or, you know, tobacco offering in that day. And because um, <clears throat> they're powerful places when you go there. The spirits, they're still there. And then this one here is on the way up to Calgary, uh, the Women's Buffalo Jump. I've brought people there a few times. And one time when I was telling the story about that uh, with Napi, he was turned into a lone pine tree by the woman leader of this women's camp but when we were still talking next thing this bald eagle flew right even with us because we're you know on the top of the um, cliff and there's a big coulee there and then that eagle was right even with us you know it's really nice to see that uh, and so these are signs that our elders are listening to us what we're doing especially like their messengers birds hey and then the eagles especially their messengers and they're showing us our elders that they're coming into this physical world to show us that 
they see us and uh, they hear what we're doing. I learned a lot too from my brother Quentin and uh, Apasius. And he says, to creator comes to us in this physical world as the sun. Because uh, the creator loves us and, you know, so the sun is our creator. And uh, this one here is riding on stone. And uh, my great, I think, great uncle, Bird Rattler, he, because um, my great grandfather on my mother's side is calf robe, and his brother was uh, uh, <clears throat> Bird Rattler. And uh, he was invited to come to uh, tell the story of riding on stone, but he was scared to come this way because uh, he did he he did some he broke some laws uh, and, and he was scared to cross the border this way. But they said he'll be okay that you know not to worry. So he did come here, and then when he told the story about it, he said these black mounds, um, that's where the spirits live in there, and then they're the ones that write these uh, things on the cliffs to show how they're um, you know when they go on a war raid or something if it's going to be successful or not. And he put in there uh, his own thing where he drives, he's driving an old car like those model Fords or something because he, that was his, kind of like a coupe or something that he's successful, something in his life. So when you go there, you'll see that there's a car there and that's him because he traveled in that kind of a vehicle to come to riding on stone. And then, um, so these are just some of our sacred uh, spiritual, sacred societies, spirituality. These, this pen, painting here, these paintings, uh, I did them myself. And so this was just uh, something I kind of made up myself. And um, so I just want to show that. But these are some of the societies we have, like Ukan, Holy Woman Society, Horn Society. Well, we pretty much know who, you know, in this room, you know all these uh, there's the Weather Dancers, Piercing Sun Dancers, Headdress Society, Magpie Society. I just named the last parts here. Um, but I I did my Piercing Sun Dance, and, and how Morris Crow got his was through dreams, and our elders that he went to, they were all passed on. So they couldn't really uh, do that for him because we don't make up these uh, ceremonies. So he was uh, directed, I guess, to... Uh, the Sioux, where they do their ceremonies way in the Black Hills, and they can't be found with, by the white people. And so they continued originally how they did their piercing sun nets. And because Morris was having these dreams, so he, it's important if you follow these dreams and things work out okay. And so that's what he did. And that elder, after he offered him his pipe, and so the, the, the elder smoked it, and then they came this way. And so we were given things from the Sioux. Uh, one is the, the large drum. Before, we just had the small hand drums. And then um, the, we had the, we have the, uh, everybody's nowadays, it's good we're going back to the stand-up headdresses. But the ones that go back, those are from the Sioux. They were gifts to us from them. And then, so the, at that time, we were gifted with the red pipe because we Blackfoot, we have black pipes, but uh, Sue, they gave us the red pipe with that piercing sun dance. And uh, so I had dreams about uh, sun dance, piercing sun dance. So that's part of why I did it. But also, you know, these societies, you join them if you're sick or somebody else is sick and you're trying to help them. And I was trying to help myself with my alcoholism because I didn't want to die from it because, you know, it, you put yourself in situations where... It's dangerous, hey. And um, uh, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm very proud of that. Um, you know, I could, you know, because with the, you know, our, it's realistic that. There's only so many bundles with the horns or the moto geeks or brave dogs, but we want to participate in our native spirituality. So this way with the, the piercing sun dance, with that, then I'm able to practice our native way because I didn't want to go back to Catholic or I didn't want to go to Christianity or anything like that. I wanted something with our native way. 
So creator, and well, I, I prayed to Jesus and Holy Mary to help me find a place where I could pray with people after I finished a child, uh, that life skills program for worlds. And I, I, I enjoy being around people. So I guess I was directed to that piercing sun dance. I found out uh, through working with the Friendship Center, and that's where uh, Morris was there as a counselor, and I slowly, that's how I met them. And But I remember when I was young, my sister Geraldine and my parents and Gilbert and Little Bear uh, Minaki, we went down there to look at the uh, Sundance long ago there, piercing Sundance, and I, you know, I got off the back of the truck, that camper, and when I was looking at those people dancing, there were seven of them, and they had that yellow holy paint on them. And I found them very, you know, like holy, you know. And then later on, when I did start helping the piercing sun dancers, like first year I was a helper, and I asked Barbara, um, when do they paint their face? And she says, they don't paint their, their face. Eh? And I told them the story that I seen these people, their faces had that yellow paint. And she said, well, the spirits are showing you because you're a child that this is what is happening. It's sacred, eh? you know, so... Um, so it, it's a good thing it's helping people, hey? And uh, so I was very happy about that. And um, But something that's kind of hurt, you know, kind of hurts is uh, when I go to, you know, different events in our in our community, they always pray for each Ganex, Moto Geeks, and, you know, people like that. But they never mention Akhanita, hey? You know, and um, we're all praying, you know, we're all the same. And so... Um, I just hope, you know, that would, you know, people to really look, you know, we're really, we're talking about caring and loving each other, but we have to look at that too. And, uh, you know, I think it was your dad or your Dan, the old man, that one time at the, this conference, and he was saying, he was scolding the people. He was telling them, just because you're in each connects doesn't mean you're higher than everybody else. All these other ones were equal and to not do that anymore, hey? So I was very proud and happy of, you know, your your dad, your uh, Dan, that he's shared that. And, you know, sometimes we need that. We need the elders to correct us when we make mistakes and stuff like that, hey? Nobody's perfect, but, you know, we have to share these things, talk about them to make change, better uh, community, uh, stop the oppression, you know, that happens. We're always talking about that. So anyways, uh, this here, it's, I didn't paint this, but it was from a book, but I think it's very good. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the four uh, areas, uh, like the mental independence, like to go to school, to be self-sufficient, uh, physical, to, to do something, like um, to be good at something, because then you're happy, you're practicing, you're learning, like that achievement, the Core values our elders tell us to try hard, hey? Uh, and so that's physical, but they overlap. When you're physically happy and that, your your mind is going to think, ha you know, good thoughts. Your emotions will feel happy and, you know, you'll, you'll your life will run better. And then this one here is really important for our young people and just other people to even older people. A sense of belonging. Uh, talk about our culture and um, our language and that. And I'm really proud of Red Crow right now, what's happening there. And uh, to help our people, you know, it's sad what's going on right now, the ones that are lost. And then the uh, uh, talking circle, sharing, and then uh, ceremonies. So... Um, <clears throat> Anyways, I wanted to uh, share this song here with you. Um, when I was in Montana, there was this man there. Uh, he's from the Osage tribe. And uh, his name was uh, Wade Bevins uh, from Oklahoma. And he came there and he said that he had a dream. And he had a dream and uh, <clears throat> it was about... He was walking on this hill, and then he came on, you know, over that hill, and there's a big encampment of people, native people back in the old days, and they were doing a round dance. And when they seen him walking down towards them, 
those el old, older people came running to him and they were really happy. And they're telling him to join with them, that they've been waiting for him to join back into the circle of the two spirit people. And so he sang that song, or they sang this song too. And so he said, I'll sing this song. And then after, um, he says, if anyone wants to use this song, you could uh, translate the words into your own language, but keep the words within that dream. And uh, he gave me a cassette too, um, because I did uh, sing this, I made a song with that dream. And um, because it was from, you know, that's how the spirits give us uh, information, uh, help us is through dreams. And so this song, uh, it's called Awawaki. I've sang it uh, a few places, including uh, just before COVID, I sang it at uh, Lethbridge City Hall when they were raising the pride flag. And then I sang it uh, these past two years um, up in Calgary City Hall. Um, if you look on my Facebook, it's Teleni Rose. I have all that on there. And um, so in those communities, when I go up there, like, I, I get invited up there a lot to do things. And um, so I use the, my name, Teleni, up there. And they, like those labels they talk about, hey, you know, well, when you're there with them, that's how they are. So I just, they say, what do you like to be called? when you're there, like, uh, he, him, or, you know, her, whatever. So I, I say he and him. So they call me that. They call me Teleni, and I really feel comfortable in that place. When uh, they come to my sweats also, I tell them, um, just dress the way you feel comfortable. My one friend, uh, he says, I don't have a sweat dress, so I gave him my sweat dress. I told him, I'll never wear that again. No. <laughs> it's a long dress, and... Uh, and then after, I didn't wear my skirt anymore. I just wore a T-shirt and shorts, you know. And I could be who I am, how I feel comfortable inside. And uh, so that's how they are. And I tell them, when you come in, usually the women sit on this side, the men sit on this side. But how you feel comfortable, just sit where you feel comfortable. And so uh, I am inviting other people here on a reserve and beginning whoever that want to come there too. And my future goal is, um, you know, like what I was telling Bruce, and um, that we hope to have a TP at the Sundance and to uh, be seen in a positive light. With, because you know, uh, when I do my presentation, I tell people, put your hands up on if you know somebody close to you that is two spirit, like a family member, a friend, or, and like 95% of the people put their hands up. Hey, so um, you know, we have to. Uh, be open-minded and more uh, kinder to people because you don't know who's uh, in the room when you make jokes about people, about being gay. So I'll sing this song. And uh, for the ones that don't understand uh, Blackfoot, it means uh, Awawaki. They say that the ancestors have been waiting for you to come back into the, you know, uh, it's hard to translate this word, uh, into the family or life. And Awawaki, we love you. So those are the words I'm going to sing.